This video was made possible by your support on Patreon. There's a reason you know this book. Even if you've never heard of the TV show, you've for sure seen some of these images in here. They're the example illustrations for a lot of Wikipedia pages on body parts. They're just, they're gorgeous illustrations, right? But here's the deal. I'm always wary whenever something within education takes on like a legendary status. And this thing has been in existence since, I mean, over 150 years. So I had some questions. At the end of the day, Grey's Anatomy is still just a book. So what makes it so special? How did Grey's Anatomy become a thing? The story starts in Victorian era London at St. George's Hospital. This is the institution where Henry Gray, the namesake behind the book, began his career and met the book's illustrator. That college featured one of the best dissection rooms at one of the best hospitals in London. And as you'll see later, Gray would need to do a lot of dissections. And somewhere around that time, Gray met a younger student at St. George named Henry Updike Carter. He was trained as an apothecary, but was going to school to become a physician. And way before he started working with Gray, he got experience creating medical illustrations for the college and local museums. This is what made Carter so special. He was a doctor, so he could dissect a body or look through the microscope firsthand, but he was also an artist who could draw accurate pictures of that body part or whatever he saw on the slide. And in 1853, Gray happened to be in the market for some drawings. He had just finished a massive essay about the spleen and got contacted by a local father-son publishing company to print it as a for sale book. So naturally, Gray went to Carter for the artwork. And surprise, a 300 page book about the spleen did not sell very well. So the publishers actually took a financial hit on that book, but it did start a working relationship with both Gray and Carter for future projects. And a few years later, they came back to them with the idea for a little textbook. The plan was simple, make a high quality general anatomy textbook that would actually sell. This book would be a manual for surgeons, so it had to be big enough to read at a distance, but small enough to fit in the operating room. At the time, most textbooks used tiny pictures with lots of wordy footnotes. So to take advantage of the page real estate, the illustrator would need to draw enormous pictures and use captions that fit around them. To get an even bigger picture, they could write the names of structures on the image to save space and eliminate extra captions. The publishers also knew the book had to be more affordable than its competition, so details like binding would have to be kept to a minimal. Nothing fancy, just a high quality book that students would want to buy. Gray was a good anatomy teacher, so he was the natural choice as the writer. And since they'd worked together before, Carter was exactly the illustrator for the job. The plan was to do about 300 illustrations, which meant they were gonna need some models to draw. And while they already had a few specimens at the university, it was pretty clear from the beginning they were gonna need to do some fresh dissections, which is kind of a big deal. To put things in perspective, only 90 years earlier, a man named William Hunter wanted to write a book about the human uterus. He got 14 bodies over the course of 25 years. To hit their deadline, Gray and Carter would have to make their drawings and dissections in 18 months. They would be able to recycle some content from the college, but they still needed fresh bodies, which begs the question, just how do you get a dead body? In the 1700s, England passed legislation that said doctors could only use convicted murderers for dissection after they'd been hanged. But thanks to all these medical schools popping up, the number of corpses needed outgrew the number of corpses available. This gave rise to resurrectionists, men who dug up freshly buried bodies and sold them back to medical schools. And as you can imagine, people weren't exactly down with this rise of grave robbing. So they pressured the government to change the law. And in 1832, parliament passed the Anatomy Act. As long as a patient's family didn't object within 48 hours, universities could take a corpse directly from hospital bed to dissection table. It gave students a fresh body to work on and eliminated the market for grave robbers. If the phrasing of that law sounds a little suspect, it's because it was. Like how long did families have to claim their bodies? Does the 48 hour timer start after death or after the family had been notified? What about people with no family? Like what if you were found dead in the workhouse or homeless on the street in the middle of winter? This new legislation put bodies on dissection tables, 
but it did so at the expense of the poor and disadvantaged. And Gray was able to use this broken pipeline to get plenty of bodies. As a physician, he made decisions about where bodies went after pronouncing them dead. And while I'm not making any judgments, some historians suspect that he used more bodies for dissection than his documentation shows. So that became the routine. From February of 1856 to July of 1857, a body would come into the dissection room, these two guys would do their cuts, they'd look under the microscope, Gray would write some words, and Carter would do some drawings. Working together, they were able to check each other's work and put words to pictures and vice versa. And Carter didn't just draw with pen on paper, he drew in a way that translated to woodcuts, the printing technology of choice for books at that time. That might seem like an unimportant technique, but it helped eliminate middlemen, which ultimately kept the cost of the book down. After the manuscript was done, now the publishers had to sell it. They knew it would do better than the spleen book, but once it actually hit the shelves, it blew away their expectations. To understand why, put yourself in the shoes of a medical student back then. You'd probably buy one high quality textbook at the beginning of med school that would last you for years. So if you're in a bookstore and you see Gray's with its massive illustrations next to the wordy pages of its competition like Quain's Anatomy, it was no question. Gray's Anatomy was such a hit because it was the best book available at the time. Now, unfortunately, Gray had one thing he wanted to edit after the manuscript was submitted, the title page. Just change Carter's title and make that text just a little bit smaller. Oh, and only Gray's name on the spine. And the financial success of the book never stopped. The publisher sold out of the first edition and got to work on a second, then another and another. And the sales kept going, where today is on its 41st edition under Elsevier. So why was Grey's Anatomy so successful? It's because it was a high quality book. Why is it still successful? Well, it never stopped making money. Now, that surface level answer seems tempting to keep. Grey's Anatomy was a success because two talented men put out a high quality product but that's not the conclusion I wanna draw. This book wouldn't have been possible to write and illustrate if it weren't for bodies to dissect. And thanks to the Anatomy Act and the socioeconomic situation at the time, those bodies tended to belong to the poorest and most vulnerable of society. It didn't matter that the family wanted a proper burial if we needed an intestine dissection for next week. As Ruth Richardson puts it in her book, There is a silence at the center of Greys, as indeed there is in all anatomy books, which relates to the unutterable. It is the gap between the ostensible subject of the book and of the discipline, and the derivation of the bodies from whom its knowledge is constituted, its illustrations made. In Greys, the legally sanctioned bodies of people utterly alone in the metropolis were the raw material for dissections that serves as the basis for illustrations. As mass-produced images, they have entered the brains of generations of the living, and nowhere but in Carter's images do they receive memorial. So yes, talented people put high quality work into Gray's Anatomy, but that work was only possible because disadvantaged people gave their lives to make that happen. Cool, so now that everyone's thoroughly depressed, what do we do with this information? If you're like me, you love anatomy, you love the human body, but it's easy to fall into this very reductionist mindset. Bodies are either healthy or bodies have disease. But every body that you come across, whether it is a living patient, a cadaver, or a name in a case study, is attached to a human life and has a story. Have fun, be good. Thanks for watching. If you want to hear more medical history, you can go ahead and click on that playlist right there. And of course, subscribe. Patreon's right here. Thanks again for watching. I, this is a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody.